All right, so I'm joined today by two um, injured members of the team. First of all, we have Niall McIntyre in studio. He's he's hurt physically. Um, his arm is in a sling. Uh, how is it, Niall? I think I'm hurt mentally as well, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you... No, it's not. It's not too bad. Like I, I got a bit of good news on Friday. I went to Limerick to find out if I had to get surgery or not. And um, thankfully, I don't have to. But I suppose the biggest pain of all with an injury like this is when you're going to miss out on my club are in a relegation semi-final now. So it's a very important stage of the season and I'm going to be missing out for that. So it's it's disappointing in that sense. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Like, I mean, do you remember the fella hit you, blindsided you? A bit like John Small, maybe, and young McLaughlin, Owen McLaughlin from Mayo. Do you remember this lad's name and are you going to seek retribution on this blindside hit? It was very similar to Oli. Do you remember James McCarthy hitting Nathan Mullins oh, in yeah. that Dublin County final? It was hard. He hard. lined you up. He lined me up and I know I just kind of picked up a ball near the sideline and I di didn't, hadn't looked inside. Your man came in, kind of nailed me on the shoulder, played on for a few minutes and <laughs> made it a bit worse then, so... But your luck, it comes with the territory. Another member of the team, he's not, another member of the team is not hurt physically, he's hurt mentally. And that is after Mayo blowing an absolutely golden opportunity to win in All-Ireland. Conor Heenan, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Thanks very much, much, Thanks Thanks very very much. much. How are those Niall scars? Ah, well, I was about to say, if Niall thinks he's in pain, he should, uh, he's a world away from the, from the, <laughs> the hurt that I'm feeling uh, at the moment. I know I'm, I'm over, I'm over Woolly, but, um, but probably only just about, I mean, you know, when, when you when you when you when you lose, lose as many, as many as they all have, it's, it's kind of hard to say which one was the toughest. But but I think th this was definitely up there. Like I I say to be honest, that the fallout is it's probably still ongoing. But it was it, you know the, the club is kind of uh, the club is the coming back is kind of taken away from it a little bit. But there's 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 a, there's lot, a lot of hurt. There's, there's a lot of anger kind of floating about. But I think ultimately it's just crushing disappointment. As he said, the opportunity was there and we didn't take it. And who knows when we're going to be back there again, you know? Yeah, well, that's it. You take a you take a messed up shoulder any day of the week other than that uh, psychological pain. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so eight in a row for Ballygunner, uh, Niall. Like, I mean, this is a domination. I always find it funny. Like, I mean, you see after the win eight in a row, you, you have other people commenting on it. Oh, this is bad for Waterford hurling, a domination. I can see that argument. You know what I mean? It makes sense. It gets boring after a while. And then you have Ballygunner argument where they say, here, lads, it's not our fault. All you have to come up to our level. Don't blame us because we're really good. And I can kind of see that argument as well. So, like, who's right and who's wrong here? Yeah, I seen Daryl Sullivan, the Ballygunner manager, was, he was trying to say that, like, it's not a bad thing for Waterford Hurling that, that's raising the standards and as he said like the Waterford team probably are at their highest level in in the last long time like so and like a, a big part to play in that is the what Bally Gunner are doing like and the amount of players that they have on this county panel like I was just looking at their team yesterday and Connor Power he was only brought on as a sub and a few years ago like he was scoring goals all around him and you're looking at him as a potential player for Waterford like but it just shows the strength and depth in Bally Gunner and I suppose the strength and depth in Watford too. Yeah, no, they're up, they're they're freakily good. There's no doubt about that. Do you have an opinion on whether a domination like there is an argument like I mean they're winning the finals very easily, Connor, but like they could have been beaten in the semi final by uh, Mount Sion. I think in the quarter final would they were ran pretty close as well. So uh, you know you probably need to know a little bit more about the ins and outs of Waterford hurling to know how bad or good it is for the county. Yeah, like I think on the surface, I think just kind of looking back over the results that you mentioned there in finals, I think they've won eight in a row. And of those eight, I think the closest that anyone got to them was four points in 2015. Like it's, they're not, they're not just, just winning finals, finals, they're absolutely dominating finals and blowing teams away. So, do you know, that, uh, like on one hand, that, 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 that maybe suggests something about the level of competition in Waterford. But as you say, Mount Zion ran very close in the, uh, in the, the semi final as well. I nearly turned, turned that back on you, Oli, and, and like, like what, what did you do? What was the situation like, like at least for the least for dominating all that time? Was it considered bad for the county or just considered maybe good for the county team that you such a kind of a, a team that was so prominent at a provincial and national level as well that that, that had to be good for Leash as well. Yeah, well, the same thing. Port Leash had come up to our level, lads, and everyone else complained about it. See, Port Leash was a was an awkward one because Port Leash was almost like a Dublin and Leinster situation because we had such a big, much bigger pick than other clubs, and it seemed almost unfair. And the level of interest yeah. in Leash football definitely um, was on on the slide. There's no doubt about that. Port Leash were just winning it every year, and like I mean, that's not good. And as it turns out. Now Port Leash aren't winning them. They're just in the mix. But it's not because the other clubs have come up to Port Leash's level. It's because Port Leash mm. have come back, you know. So I don't really know um, how, to, what to, you know, what side to come down on on that, on the Leash example. Um, it's much more exciting championship in Leash now. But can any Leash team 
challenge a Dublin team in Leinster I would say absolutely not mm. so like I mean it, it's hard to know another thing out of yesterday Stephen O'Keefe retired I think he retired in the interview after the game because mm. I was oh, everyone was expecting him back he took a year out um, to go travelling and it's an interesting one he's only 30 um, so he said I've given it a good 9 or 10 years now and that chapter is finished for myself so he's only 30 Philip Mahoney's only 30 he's gone 2 years Barry Coughlin's only 31 he's gone 2 years all these Bally Gunner lads kind of going I'm going to take a step out and almost guarantee the county title a run in the Munster Club and that's my year without the hassle of the inter-county I can still enjoy my hurling year with the club that I'm at do you know what I mean? I suppose it kind of shows how high of a level that Bally Gunner are at like that these lads they may have retired from Waterford they're still playing for Bally Gunner and like I was just lit watching that Stephen O'Keefe interview I thought it was just a, it was a real brilliant kind of refreshing sort of an interview like like nobody as you said nobody knew he was retired from from Waterford, but he was kind of content. Just slipped it into the conversation there, and TG Carr, no, that's finished now. He kind of just walked off quietly, like, and I thought it was a brilliant interview. But in general, yeah, the the Bally Gunner lads, like the strength and depth they have, it's just it's unbelievable, Willie. Really. Yeah, no, it definitely is. They've eight weeks now to their Munster club. We've Porik Mahoney coming up on the show, um, in part two to talk to us about that match and a little about bit about his last year. Funnily enough, Porik Mahoney. Hasn't missed a club championship in the last two years. After his ACL, he was out for nine months with his knee, but he missed two inter-county seasons. So that's a very kind of unusual situation. In the relegation match in Waterford, De La Salle beat Bally Sagard. Bally Sagard had gone back down. Stephen Bennett scored 1-8. Um, so it would have been a big shock for De La Salle to have gone down there. Talking about relegation matches, uh, Connor, Dr. Croaks versus Killarney, Re- Killarney Legion in a relegation match. What are the chances of this? So Ken Mayer Shamrocks beat uh, Dr. Croaks. Um, Sean O'Shea scored 15 points out of 17. I think 13 were from freeze, but like, you know, the freeze he scored, it could have been from anywhere. Mm. Um, like, I mean, Croaks have won seven of the last 11 uh, titles, obviously Munster titles and an all Ireland club there as well. And while Killarney Legion were in the 2015 um, final. So, like, I mean, this is a huge relegation match. What are these two clubs is going down to intermediate, which is hard to, hard to understand? Yeah, it, it's unfathomable, uh, Willie, really, for, for, for Crokes to, to be in that situation, given um, given their record in All-Ireland Club, you know, in the last few years, that we could be looking at them in intermediate. But just kind of digging a bit deeper into the results, I think they were, they were kind, kind of caught, caught in the hop, maybe, maybe in the first game. game. And, you know, just the way the way the, way the group is going, they found, found themselves in the relegation playoff. Whereas Legion, as far as you know, they were well beaten by uh, Kerns Rallies and, and Austin Sachs, and, and they lost to Dingle as well, so... You imagine, imagine that the you know Crokes would be favourite favorite 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 you know, being at that level would be, would be, would be yeah, yeah, it just seems unfathomable to me, yes. Yeah, Spa drew with Temple No. Um, so Spa stay up as a senior team. They obviously avoided the releg- relegation. It was 13-man Temple No. So Spa kind of mess up East Kerry. I saw David Clifford talking about this. Spa have like eight or nine on the East Kerry uh, panel when they won the county title and maybe four on the team as well. So definitely that's not good news for East Kerry who are trying to retain... Uh, retain the title but congratulations to Spa for staying up uh, staying up in uh, as a senior team I was in a Moor Park last night Portlaoise beat St Joseph's Portlaoise were impressive in the first half um, I thought they played very good football scored 9 points against the defensive-ish St Joseph's and then they weren't great in the second half but did enough uh, to win it but like I mean the big talking point about this was kind of farcical situations uh, Niall before the game so this, this was a triple header in a Moor Park there was a game at 3, 5 and 7 and Portlaoise arrived there and the teams at five had a small bit of space in the stand. I was sitting in the stand, the whole stand in the Moor Park, it's 5,000 people. It was nearly all, especially when you space people out, it's nearly full. So like, I mean, we used to have a situation when the games were behind closed doors, the whole stand would be free. So all all six teams could have their own section of the stand. And, it, you know, it wasn't ideal, but it, it, was, it made sense. They had a covered area um, where they could um, tug out. Now the stand's full. The, the two teams that were in the five o'clock game were using the little small area in the stand that m- must have been cordoned off for the, the teams. Port Leash were out. It was a torrential downpour 
in Port Leash at about half past five, quarter to six. I was driving in it. Port Leash were outside the centre of excellence, standing under about a foot of shelter with a physio table there, getting treated mm-hmm. and getting together in the, in the spills of rain before a game as the centre of excellence door is closed with dressing rooms just <laughs> just behind them. Mm. Like, you know, like, I mean, I keep talking about this. It's not the first time we talked about it. Three weeks more of this. Complete and utter nonsense. Yeah, it was the picture of the fella getting the rub, Willie. He was just sitting up, no top on <laughs> yeah. the physio there. Like, it just kind of hammered home how ridiculous the whole thing is. Like, and like, as you said, stands, they're probably, it's probably not the ideal situation, like when there's people around you in the stand trying to prepare for a championship game, but it's certainly a lot better than getting ready under a gutter in the lash and rain. Like, it was just your picture. It just kind of summed up, I suppose, the ridiculousness of that six people are allowed into the dressing room at a time. Like, that's never really going to work. Like, do you know, no, it's that's, just... that's only good for going in, getting your jersey and mm. coming out. The team has to be together, right? So, like, I mean, the situation, Connor, was they weren't allowed to even go in and get their... Go, they weren't even allowed to go into the dressing rooms in sixes until the game out in the field was over. Even though there's four dressing rooms down under the tunnel in a moor park, plus a gym that could have been you. Just this stuff, it just makes no sense to me. It's getting very frustrating. And the fact that, like, I got got out of the, got into the car this morning, it was six degrees, Connor. Like, I mean, it's it's we're at winter time now, and like, I mean, yeah. the least the GEA could do here is cut these three weeks off and let lads go into a dressing room. And the the farcical situation. Um, my last thing to say about this was they weren't allowed to use the dressing rooms or they weren't allowed to use the showers even though the GEA have permitted shower use if if necessary or under you know circumstances you'd wonder where they what have that to. means really what, what does that mean so they weren't allowed to use the dressing rooms they were sent home in wet dirty gear the Port Leash lads an awful lot of them went home got a shower headed into town and sat together in a pub <laughs> like I mean uh, like on what planet does this make sense anymore yeah, yeah, no, it, it doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. The fact that, uh, that just sums up the fact that, they, you know, all the lads there that were huddled under the gutter, as Niall said, getting wet and then they're in the pub, you know, a few hours later. It just, uh, it, it, uh, it makes no sense. Like, I, I remember, Willie, I, I came on in a junior game a few weeks ago and probably similar to yourself yesterday, there was an unmerciful downpour to, to, to the extent that, that you know where the jersey is like an extension of your skin. It's literally stuck to it. You can't, you have to get somebody to nearly help you take it off. Yeah. that wet. I was fine with me because like we were playing in Kajma, I just literally had to hop in the car and I was up the road. But I was thinking of the you know the players of the other team and they it absolutely, absolutely got saturated the skin. They all have to hop in the car and drive home for maybe forty five minutes afterwards. So you know, and we're talking about uh, talk about looking after people's health as well, and I don't think that's that's necessarily conducive to to to, to being healthy either. So I know like this, it just like it's not as if the GA has hasn't provided this already, already in terms of inter county teams. You know, the, 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 there was a protocol put in place to allow inter county teams to use dressing rooms. So I don't know, it's just, is it a lack of trust for those at club level, especially when these guidelines will be going out the window in a few weeks, as you said? So it's, but it's just, it took, it took, it took a situation, situation like yesterday, yesterday where you, you have, have to, to see, see a picture like that yeah. just to see how ridiculous the situation is. Like, I'm surprised more pictures haven't been taken because that picture of a team in a knockout championship match standing in against the wall as tight as they can to stay dry mm. before they go and play a championship match. You have to look at the picture to go, holy shit. I didn't, I'd say people didn't really think. Do you know? Mm. I'm sure they thought, because you had Stevie yeah. McDonald talking about Kalevi playing, they're playing next weekend in Eden Dork. And he's saying Eden Dork doesn't, don't even have a stand. Like We're going to be out in it, but without seeing it. Do you know what I mean? You, 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 just, you just think, ah, they'll be grand. You're nearly getting so used to these sort of crazy things of like people getting togged out in the rain that it doesn't even register with you anymore. Like, mm. it's just, the GA just seemed to be, like, that six, and it's just to be seen to be doing the right thing, like, but it's clearly the wrong thing that they're doing, do you yeah. know? Like, because this type of weather, as you said, six degrees getting into the car this morning, that's the type of weather you'll get colds and flus and waiting around for a shower after a game, waiting around in the wet before a game. Yeah. So that's the worst thing you could possibly do in this weather. Standing outside for your team talk at halftime. They couldn't even go in. Like, I mean, ah, that's look, not championship prep. That's not preparation for a championship game. Do you know, like, no. thinking of players going out to play a big game and having to stand there in the rain, their gear getting soaked before they even go out. Like, that's just... Yeah, no, it's completely... It's completely I, the, I, I've heard anecdotally, Connor, whether you can confirm or deny it, that Mayo uh, clubs are completely disregarding these rules and they're allowing the use of their dressing rooms. Can you confirm or deny this? <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny uh, whether you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, no, I tell you what, Willie. I I was, I was at, at one game. game I tell you, I was at one game the weekend, and I watched another on Mayo GA TV. So I I didn't see what happened before the games 
in uh, you know in either game what happened with the dressing room situation. But at half time in both games, one entire team went into the dressing room at half time and the other didn't. So, right. so like, like, I'm, I'm not, not sure why exactly that was. Did the team just decide for themselves that they were going in and that was that? Um, but you know, I'm I, 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 I'm nearly sure that was the case, not just in Mayo, but probably in clubs all around the country as well, because. I don't know, we're just talking about how ridiculous the situation, situation is. So maybe people, people have taken the matters into, into their own hands, and in this in this case, I don't have that much of an issue with them doing it at all. No, no, because it is player welfare at the end of the day. And if a club turned around and said, "Listen, lads, go in there and get a hot shower before you go home," like I mean, that's using your own brain rather than being dictated to. A um, couple of interesting results in the club uh, in Mayo. Uh, uh, Bell Mullet 2-4 to 1-4 not exactly a classic here um, Ryan Donoghue's club Bell Mullet and obviously the Mullet from Bell Mullet we all know who that is Willie Joe Padden so it's good to see them they beat the defending champions Knockmore and Westport beat Castlebar Mitchells again this year looks like Castlebar Mitchells uh, dominance is a thing of the past yeah well Mitchells didn't even get out of the group last year yeah. um, well it was the first time in I think 8 or 9 years uh, possibly no I think it was since 2007 and Westport, Westport were in their, in their group last year, last year and they beat them well. They beat them very well, actually. Uh, now, I watched a lot of that game on Saturday. It was a terrible game for about 20 minutes. I think it was one all at the first quarter break. It was very defensive. But opened up a lot in the second half. Uh, Willie Westport are a class team. I, like, I took them to, to, to win Mayo last, last year. year. I'm tipping them again uh, this year. They were beaten in by Bravely in the semi final, but they were very wasteful last year. So just very strong uh, throughout. Uh, Lee Geegan was, he was playing cornerback. Um, He's marking Neil Douglas, who's probably been the outstanding, you know, forward in the club game, game in Mayo over the last couple of years, and just didn't give him a sniff, and then kicked an inspirational point himself. Fionn McDonough has been in and out of the county setup. He was midfield. He was excellent. Um, and they have a couple of just really standout forwards as well. So they, they'll be hard stopped. And then um, not more. But yeah, Ben Mullet came up, came up to me to meet only a couple of years ago. And uh, I know we talk about, I think it's Ockram as the ultimate tough place to go in... Um, in GAA, but there's there's nowhere harder than than Ben Mullet. It's just like gale force threes are part of the course, and Ben Mullet know the pitch so well that they know how to deal with the conditions. So it was, it was I think two four to one four, and I think the second half was two points to one, uh, to not more. So, but yeah, that was a bit like not more. Probably aren't firing firing on all cylinders that they were this year, but that still is a massive scalp. And then they're also in a group with Charlestown who are coming strong as well. As well. So not more, not more, not more playing Charlestown. And, and they, they could be out. They don't win in the in the last group game. So that like it's it's um it's really there's a lot of groups like that in Mayo. It's it's it's, it's really exciting. It's hard to pick a winner as well. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely heating up. They obviously aren't knockout games. Not more still in it like Connor like Connor said. In Kenny hurling, uh, now I thought this was a very interesting one. So Lachlan Gales um, beat Roar in his. In his toig. In his teag. In his teag. I got that <laughs> wrong last year. I've got corrected on it, and a year later I forget it again. Yes. Anyways, you have it right. Paddy Deegan's playing full forward. He scored five points from play. Uh, now they scored three twenty-five, but I cu- I couldn't believe this. I reckon Brian Cody's looking at this, going, hmm, "That's a very interesting one. You'd be able to play TJ at centre forward all the time. A little file for home Cody in the full forward line. Paddy Deegan, who would have thought this? Yeah, I think club full backs and Kilkenny will be telling the feck off down the other end of the field now in the team, <laughs> but. Um, like yeah, Paddy Deegan. Like I seen, I just seen he's been playing there all year for Lachlan Gales. Woolly, um, Andy Comerford, the former Kilkenny manager, or the former Kilkenny player and former Kildare manager. He's the Lachlan Gales manager, and he's had Paddy Deegan in there. I suppose they've Hugh Lawler as a centre back, and they've another big man fullback, a Tony Forrestal fella. So I suppose they're just they've been kind of there thereabouts lacking something in Kilkenny. Yeah. So they're probably saying. Do you know, we'll try something here. And Sir Paddy Deegan, he's such a big man, such a physical player, a ball winner. He's the type of lad you'd lump ball in on top of him and you'd like it, it'd be hard to beat him to a ball for any full back. Like, and I suppose since Colin Friendly left the Kilkenny well, team, that's what I'm thinking, know, yeah. yeah. Like, Paddy Deegan, it, it would be quite you don't see it too often these days, do you? Like, a player completely changing from a back to especially a full forward, like, but and it's not something you would have seen coming. But the more I think about it, like, I think. Paddy Deegan, he'd do a job. Like, he, like as you said, he'd throw the ball out to Owen Cody, these sort of fast lads around him. And I think he could do a job there for Kilkenny. Like. Well, that's it. I See, I was thinking uh, he could do a job and I'd understand that. It's the five points I can't, I can't mm. get my head around. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, What's your role in there, mate? Are you throwing it around or are you actually going to be a scoring <laughs> forward? I was reading the report they played Dixborough uh, the week before, Wooly, and it was just Paddy Deegan was full forward. Paddy Deegan didn't get a score. It was just he was causing all sorts of problems for the Dixborough right. full back. You know, they had a titanic tussle. Um, 
and he was throwing balls out to his fellow forwards. But maybe now he's getting more used to it. Paddy says, I'm going to stick over a few points here now. Who's your man in Tipperary? His name is uh, jumping at me here now. He was a full back to full forward, Shelley. He might be a little bit older. Was it Shelley? He was a hard man, no nonsense, cornerback, fullback who turned full forward and it was an awful handful. Jeez, Woody, Shelley? I'm going to be crucified in Tipperary now for not knowing <laughs> this one. But I, suppose. Woody, sorry. I, I never said as well, well that when, when I was mentioning, mentioning Westport, Westport there, uh, Kevin, Kevin Kane, Kane, obviously former fullback for, uh, for Mayo, is now playing full forward for Westport and has been for the last couple of years and scored, I think, three points from play against Caspar on Saturday and had been playing really well. Um, so just, you know, it just the Paddy D example, example reminded me, so it's, it's obviously not, not just limited to Kenny. Yeah, we know Keane isn't great under a high ball. Let's go back to another <laughs> heartbreaking All-Ireland 2012, Connor. I'll say nothing. I'll say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, one second, lads. We're just going to break it there. I want to find out what this lad gets. It'll it's save you and me. Michal Webster. No, no, that's not who you're thinking no. of. When oh, was it, Shelley. Willie? Uh, around the 2000. Uh, he's, yeah, you're wrong, is man. It, not it is Shelley. It is Shelley. Paul Shelley. Jeez, I've never fucking You don't heard remember him? I've never heard of him. <laughs> there it is. Here he is. Paul Shelley. That's it. OK, I'll just start back with him. Paul Shelley. Where is he from? What club there? Just so I have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably give, weren't give, even born at this stage. I was free, bad. I'd say. Give my no credit for this, this Willie. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll just start back here now, anyways, <clears throat> from what you said. Paul Shelley, is it Paul? Wait, I won't go that high. <laughs> Paul Shelley was his name. That was his name. Yeah, cornerback. No nonsense. Hard as nails, this fella is. Listen, it's, it was before your time, Lyle. Don't feel bad about it. <laughs> That's okay. It doesn't make only, you any less of a I temporary was, man. I was only three years of age there around 2000, <laughs> so I wasn't, wasn't too big into the hurling back then. Yeah, well, all I'd be saying, I wouldn't be starting on this Paul Shelley, lad, anyways, because he looked like he was as hard, um, hard as nails. Another bit of news here, lads, is Kildare have announced their management team. This came out of the blue, uh, Connor, completely, because... Um, Glenn Ryan apparently the talk is didn't actually want to interview for this job and uh, everybody was talking that this is Tom Cribbins and yeah. if anybody if Tom Cribbins doesn't get it it's Davy Burks and Glenn Ryan wasn't in the mix at all and then at the last hour last Thursday Glenn Ryan agreed to, to um, interview for the job he's brought in Anthony Ray and Bodern Maderi and Johnny Doyle it's like anyone who's ever won an all-star in Kildare is on this bloody team and, you know, after so many years of kind of outside managers, Kildare have four legends over the team now. And kind of, I don't know, it has excited me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and I think I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I think I heard Brian Lacey is involved now as well, um, which leads me to wonder, like, how quickly Glenn was able to get these guys together. Was it the thing that he, you know, they talked about this in the background for a long time? Or was it the thing that... The vacancy, the vacancy suddenly became, became available, available. An opportunity became available last week, and he decided to get the band back together. It's like a, it's like the reformation of a supergroup or something like that. But uh, to me, like I, I like I, I would say this is a big boost for you know without being you know centrally involved in it. I would say it's a right boost for Kildare football, football because I'd say, I'd say there's, there's a lot of hurt about, about the Jack O'Connor stuff. Um, you know the, the way he went about it, it was a little bit unedifying. Um, so, so I'd say there was a lot of you know disappointment and maybe a bit of anger about you know the whole process. So to get you know you could not draw, draw well, whatever, whatever Brian is he, if it's five, but you could not get you know four more iconic names in Kildare football than than the four lads. You know, um, and it's not just it's not just just their names either. Like then Ryan was over the team that uh, the Longford team that beat Mayo uh, way back in 2010. Yeah, before, before the whole era. Anti Rainbow's, Rainbow's manager with Carlo Valley Bowden. And like if Johnny Doyle coaches a good game as as well as he talks a good game on this show, well then you know he's he's, he's going to be a huge addition to the setup as well. So I don't know, like I I without you know having you know huge insight into their, their coaching coach intentions, I think it's a big, big thing for Claire and especially you know not, there's nothing wrong with outside managers, but when you haven't had you know a native manager for a long time, it just it, I think it might just get 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 people kind of you know get get the grow back and, and get the interest back in Claire, and it's certainly what they need at the moment. I think that's important with Kildare to kind of thrive on momentum. And I don't know, maybe I'm being influenced by the 97, 98 Mikko kind of, you know, the interest in that. And uh, Jack O'Connor didn't really capture that. Yeah. He didn't really like, you know, they were kind of meh. 
Like there was, was there much improvement in them in the two years? If we're being honest, not really. I didn't mm. see too much of it. Like whereas Glenn Ryan, Anthony Rainbow, Dermot Early, and Brian Lacey, and he's got inter county experience with Tipperary. Like I mean, that is something that will ex- excite Kildare clubs, excite their fans, and Newbridge will will be hopping for their first league game. As I proved there a minute ago, Wally, my knowledge of maybe 2000s <laughs> GA isn't all that good, but <laughs> if I was asked to name f- four Kildare players, and like you're talking about iconic Kildare players, they're the four lads that you'd name. And like Glenn Ryan, he's managed Longford before, and as we were saying this morning, he managed Round Towers to that big win over Moorfield as well. So he's coming in with a bit of form into the hot seat. Yeah, he is. And I remember, I keep, keep kind of using this as an example, maybe with the online abuse. The time we, the mistake happened on the show with the Eddie Brennan interview, like I was kind of at home really kind of low after that and the phone rings and it's Glenn Ryan and I, d- I don't know Glenn Ryan well like I mean I interviewed him maybe once or twice played against him and he rang me up to see how I was he says don't worry about that all Wooly just stay away from that like there are a lot of begrudgers out there and I was thinking like he pepped me up like imagine mm. what kind of a man manager this lad is like Connor. not only to the, 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 the way he's able to pep you up but to identify that lad could do with a phone call. Like, I mean, that's gone above and beyond anything he needed to do there. So I can only imagine how good he would be with his own team, you know? And, and, and when you're a complete gentleman like that and selfless like that, players will really respond to that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, that, that's, that's a huge thing. That's, that's a huge thing for him to do because, uh, like, I know you would have played against each other and probably had some massive battles and probably a few words, you know, every now and again. But just to... Just, just, to ident- to, just to identify, identify the fact that you mightn't be in a great place and, and to just say, you know, I'll give this fella a phone call and if it has the little impact and it obviously had more of a li- uh, more than a little, little impact going on what you're saying, saying there. And, and just, just that, 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 that ability to... Because um, like I say there, I don't know much about Glenn Ryan's coaching credentials, but like in terms of his... Ma- that speaks so much for his man management ability. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's going to be half the battle. And if he's the man that's... Everything, everything about, about everything, everything that I, I remember, remember about, about Glenn Ryan is inspirational. If he's going to inspire people, if he's going to be that good of a man manager, and he can look after that side of it, and he maybe his anti Rainbow and Brian Lacey to look after the coaching end of it, that just that just speaks um, that just speaks volumes for Kildare. But the, the point you made there, I think, is crucial about, about Jack, Jack O'Connor maybe not getting it. You know, it was a bit mad. There was a bit of apathy about Kildare football, to be honest. And, yeah, whatever happens with Glenn Ryan, you can certainly guarantee that that won't be the case. Yeah, definitely. Talking about Jack O'Connor, the man he replaced, Peter Keane, released a statement um, in the time since the last show. Um, he says, unfortunately, losing the semi-final by one point in extra time to the eventual all in winners led to a decision uh, to end the work that we had started and the momentum we had built. I know the players very much wanted us to continue with our project. They were the reason I wanted to stay. We were a United Kerry team with a great sense of purpose and ambition. Um, I suppose he's right. He lost the semi-final by a point after extra time. This will tell you how demanding <coughs> Kerry kind of is as a county and the fact that they have had a lot of success underage has made them even more demanding and they haven't won an All-Ireland since 2015, um, which you know is starting to really annoy them. He said that the players very, want, very much wanted us to continue with our project. Now, Sean O'Shea and David Clifford run Terrace Talk. I have to say, give cre- Terrace Talk their due. Like, I mean, I'd have no chance of getting those two on, on the show. Um, I remember asking Sean O'Shea, it was his debut coming off. They played Clare. Um, I walked over to him on the field and he just kind of brushed me away. He said, like, Sean O'Shea just doesn't do much interviews. And uh, David Clifford, not even after a match, but terrace talk with the local pull are able to get these lads on it but anyways the point of the matter is Sean O'Shea was asked about it and he said as players our job is to go out in the field and play and everything outside that is left to the people in charge in the county board now I suppose if they had made if the players very much wanted them to continue would Sean O'Shea have referenced that you know I suppose it's I don't think so Not I don't think so in this kind of day and age I don't think county players and especially young lads. But you see him saying, out. but him saying they wanted Peter Keane to continue wouldn't necessarily mean they didn't want Jack O'Connor to get it. Because if if Peter Keane continued, when they gave them the support, that was probably before you know there was any other nominations, for example. Yeah, but it'd be kind of would it be interpreted as kind of they're longing for Peter Keane, mm. and you yeah. know, I'd say the lads probably, regardless of what they wanted, they were just not going to say anything about it. You know, it kind of just brush over it either way I'd say to be honest yeah I don't know Niall probably has a point Connor. I suppose if he had said yeah we, we were after Peter Keane the headlines would be players don't want O'Connor maybe or something like that 
So yeah, that that's exactly it. And at that stage, well, like I know Jack O'Connor hadn't probably hadn't been made official at that stage, but it looked like it was going to happen. So they're probably thinking as well, even though they're the two best players, and Jack O'Connor would be a fool if he's going to, you know, create some sort of divide with the two of them. But they did might necessarily want to do anything that might affect their relationship with Jack, Jack O'Connor, O'Connor uh, down, down the line, line as well. As well. Like, like I, I heard that said that you know, oh, Cliff, Clifford and O'Shea might have said something, but what I'd read more into is the rumblings that I've heard since that. Well, while Peter Keane says we were united and all the pairs were behind it, I've heard that that, that, that might not necessarily be 100% the case. You know, that it would be support, but maybe tentative support, let's say. So I, I, I'd, be, I'd be putting more reading into that, but I'd be with Niall in terms of they don't want to give this... Whatever whatever they said, it would give them the legs. They support yeah. O'Connor. They support, they support Peter, Peter Keane. And, and by, by saying what they said, which is essentially, with due respect to the lads, nothing... Do you know, they're just they're just ending it there and preventing them from being involved in the story for another few weeks. It's a very difficult one, actually, for a panel of players. So Peter Keane will go to them, look, lads, we want to stay. Do you want us to stay? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? What did they say? No. Then they're ousting a manager, like, and Mayo players got very bad press for that at the time. So, like, play, play, he could be the manager next year. So anyone that says no, you know, it could be involved. You know, it's a really yeah. difficult one yeah. for players to answer um, maybe you know honestly I know maybe he sent them away into a room to come back but again he's applying for the job next year you don't know if he's going to, you know, yeah. it's just a difficult one to, to you know when he says we had the backing of the players yeah I'd say there's very few players who would say to a manager who could be there next year no we don't want you like I'd say it's more probably the sound of the silence if players say nothing then that's your no, like, you know, because they would let you know if they want you to stay on. And like, we, we, we don't know what, what, what way it was in Kerry, you know, like it's kind of behind the scenes, like you just don't know what way it was. So, um, yeah. And I'm sure it wasn't know. terrible. It's not like, you know, that it was a, a, a terrible management team. Like it was clearly a decent management team. So maybe the players wouldn't, wouldn't have minded that much or a lot of them wouldn't mind. It's, mm-hmm. Anyways, listen, we probably talked too much about that Kerry job. Peter Keane's gone at this stage now. Um, another one is that, yeah, so the GPA, have, Connor, have come in right behind this league championship uh, proposal. And what they have done is they're asking players to lobby their county boards. Um so senior inter-county football squads are to lobby their county board to support the league championship. Support for the B uh, proposal is overwhelmingly um, among players, so much now that they're prepared to contact officials to back the motion. I just, out of curiosity, last Friday rang, a, rang around a few counties and they're all, um, none of them have actually met yet, but the individuals mm. that I spoke to were all in favour of the league-based championship. But you don't know what happens. And then you don't know what happens when the county meets and they mandate the delegate, whether the delegate votes the way they tell them to or not, because they can do it in secrecy and they mightn't fancy this at all. Um, so we don't know. But it is interesting, like, the GPA are actually telling, like, imagine, I suppose, the county, the county captain, like the James McCarthy or Johnny Cooper, going into that county board meeting and saying, lads, this is what... This is what we're after. This is what we want. And the same in other counties. Like, I mean, that w- surely that has influence, um, Connor. Well, like, they're the ones that are going to be playing it. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? So surely that should be the prime consideration. But as we've, you know, we've come to see in the past, that's not necessarily the case, especially, especially when, when, you know, Congress, Congress is involved. involved. But I was glad to see uh, the GPA come out because, and, and, and I've heard a few players come out publicly and back as well. And that's important because, uh, you know, the, the worry about this, and I think you might have brought this up last week, Willie, was that not enough, um, not enough, enough kind of light would, would be shed on how important uh, a decision this is going to be and how, how big of an impact it's going to make on, on the football championship for years to come. And the danger being that we would eventually get to Congress, not enough information is out there, not enough public support is out there for Proposal B, and that it just it wouldn't get the necessary 60%. So, so you know, you know, it's, it's kind of... Um, you know, you know, logic, logic should, should dictate, dictate that, that if the players say, and they're overwhelmingly back it, if the players say that they want this proposal, that that's what should go ahead because they're the ones going to be playing it, as I said. But I, I just hope that's the case, case because, because to be honest, honest I'm, I'm, seeing, seeing, I'm seeing plenty of, you know, opposition to proposal B or support for the status quo. I'm not seeing much support for that other proposal A, but I'm seeing a bit of support for the status quo and the danger is that, that you know, that get enough support that that's, that's what we're going to be stuck, stuck with. That's the problem. One man who is completely against uh, Proposal B is Brian McAvoy, who's the Ulster Secretary. He's going above and beyond trying to rubbish this Plan B. So much so I contacted him and he's coming on the show on Thursday. So we'll be able to have... And it, he, he pretty much knows from my interactions with him where, where my... Uh, 
where, where, which side I'm coming down on. So it would be interesting conversation between me and Brian. I have a few bones to pick with him because, like, I mean, maybe he listens to the show and now I'm giving him a, a heads up on, on what I'm going to say. Like, I mean, he says, even if we drill down further, you're in Division 3, but you end up being relegated to Division 4. Then you end up winning the Talton Cup. Not only are you going to go out, or not only then... Are you going to get out of Division 4? You're going to be promoted to Division 2. How in the name of God could people come up with that? So what he's saying, if you win the Talton Cup, you get, you get promotion, right? But if you're relegated, you don't get promotion. You only get, you only, you're not relegated. So the third bottom team would be relegated. Do you understand what I mean? So like, I mean, you, you definitely get, if there's a carrot for winning the Talton Cup, if you're just mid-table, you get promoted. If you're relegated, you don't get relegated. There's no question the situation that Brian is trying to um, trying to say. He says, if you drill down further, he's trying to say that you can get relegated from three down to four, win the Talton Cup and get promoted to two. That is not true. It's misinformation, Brian. It's not true. And then he has the absolute cheek to continue on. He says, I've spoken to some inter-county players and when I've explained to them the proposal, they've looked at me mesmerised and said, we weren't told that. They weren't told it because it's not true, Brian. You're making this up. Like, I mean, this is what's really frustrated me. I can't wait to talk to Brian because he's on record, Connor, giving out misinformation and telling people that players are amazed when they hear this. Yeah, well, this, yeah, this is the problem. problem. So, so not, not only is there not enough, enough information out there, there's actually misinformation out there from some of the key stakeholders. Do you know what I mean? So that's that, that's the problem. There was You picked out that particular um, instance, Willie, of, of what he was saying. What I... I took another issue with, with he was kind of saying that um, I think he said you could have a situation where a Division 1 team loses 4 or 5 games under this system and the manager says to himself if I'm not going to take the top make the top 5 I'll take my chances I'd rather be relegated because we make the championship next year if we finish in the top 3 I, and I just like, like that, that, that's, that's such a retrograde, retrograde kind of you know that's such a retrograde kind of scenario what, what manager would be thinking like that you know yeah. like sure, surely it's all about kind of um, long term but you like no team no team wants to get relegated because the higher up they're playing, the better quality opposition they're playing all the time. And that's, that's going to that's that's gonna gonna make them better and give them better chance of success as well. I mean, I, I could drill like I could drill down into, you know, a lot of the stuff he said and I, I kind of I you know poke holes in it, but I think you're going to be a better man to do that than me and look forward to hearing what he has to say in response on Thursday. Yeah, so like I mean, Brian, listen, I don't have a problem with Brian. Brian obviously doesn't like B. I passionately love B. So we're going to have a disagreement. I told him we'd have a, a light hearted debate, which we will or a a good natured debate, which we will, um, which will be absolutely no form, no harm. So I'm looking forward to have Brian on the show I'm to find. I'm looking forward to it as well. Really. <laughs> so, but like, I mean, that and, and we've talked about that before, Connor, as well. I mean, why have Kildare been desperate to get out of Division Two into Division One? Why have Mead been desperate to get out of Division Two into Division One? Why have Galway, when they were in Division Two, so desperate to get out of it into Division One? Armagh, any of them? It's to play the top teams. You yeah. think this mad scenario that Brian is envis- envisaging that Armagh will say, here, do you know what? We've lost our first four games. We're not good enough for these teams. We'll go back into Division 2. We'll get first place in Division 2. Armagh, you're going to have to play those big teams in the quarterfinal. And you won't yeah. have played them all year. And you're going to get beaten. And then you're going to say, geez, you know what? We weren't playing the top teams. And we're just, you know, we were taken by surprise. It's a much higher standard. I don't buy that. Um, I don't buy that at all. I see zero disadvantage. Now, I know I'm very uh, biased towards this plan B. I see zero disadvantages outside of the prestige of the Ulster Championship because the other three, I think, can live with it. The Ulster Championship has a prestige and I understand that's what Brian is probably trying to protect. But at the same time, if it's as special as they all say it is, why can't it continue special? Why does it have to be connected to the All-Ireland if it's as good as they all say it is? It should yeah. keep its prestige if the Ulster Championship is the Munst- like the Munster Hurling Championship. Do you know what I mean? It, ha- it has to. Yeah. Or else it's not as good as they're saying. Connor. But the, the thing, thing is, the thing, thing is, is as well, is that like the way it is at the moment, a lot of the Ulster Ch- Championship teams will be playing against each other in competitive games, you know, at the height of summer anyway. I know it's not the Ulster Championship in its traditional form, but it's like, it's like Ulster teams, like, you know, you know high quality Ulster, Ulster teams, teams playing really competitive games against each other at the height of summer, which is, Exactly what you want. Like, th- there was another thing. Like, I, I completely listen. I completely get the 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 kind of prestige that like all these people put in their championship. It's the best championship in certainly in football. Niall will never let me get away with saying it's better than the Munster Hurling Championship. We won't go there. But, but you know, there was like 
he said something as, 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 as well. He's like, you lose your first three or four games, you're in danger of relegation. But, but you've already lost, lost your main focus. And I was kind of like, how many games, games do you want? Like, do, yeah. do you know, like, it's, if, if you're losing your first three or four games, games well, then, well, then just, just like, like, you know, know if you, 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 you're, you're on a, you're on a bad path anyway, anyway. It's it's probably, that season's probably, probably not going to go well for you. But it's just, I think you made the point there that, like, in terms of, you, you can't find any kind of, you know, you can't find zero fault with your proposal B. Like, in terms, in terms of, of the options, options that are on the table, I know my bias as well, I support as well, but I just can't see how anybody would push either the status quo or that other proposal A that nobody seems to support out in front of proposal B. Yeah, me neither. Like, and again, if some of the things I've had issues with Brian said, and Brian said something like, it's the worst proposal he's ever seen go to Congress. Like, come on, Brian. Like, I mean, I'm definitely starting the interview with that quote. The worst, yeah. the worst proposal he's ever seen come to Congress. Jesus, Brian. Anyways, listen, we look forward to that on, on Thursday. Colin Bonner has finalised his backroom team um, he's named Tommy Don. Tommy Don is just a selfless servant of mm. Tipperary hurling, isn't he? He's best his third management team now to be in under. He's not looking for any glory limelight. He's a very, very good coach. The Dublin lads loved him. And now he's back in again under a new management. And interesting, Colin Bonner said, I ha- I've been a big, big fan of Tommy since our playing days together. And while I was keen to ensure some continuity to the setup, Tommy is really excited about the new approach we've been discussing over the last number of weeks. Yeah. What's this? What is this now? <laughs> well, I couldn't tell you, Wooly, but um, all I can say is like when a, when a fella goes in as a selector or kind of in working with a team and not as the manager, I suppose you could nearly compare it to Stephen Rochford in with Donegal. It kind of says a lot about their sort of character that they don't really want the headlines. They just kind of want to be involved. And like that seems to be the way with, with Tommy Dunn, definitely. And um, like as you said there, Colin Bonner, he seems to be hitting all the right notes. Like he yeah. said... There's definitely, I'd say, there's no other county that takes their divisions as seriously as we do in Tipperary. And um, he has a man in the setup from each of the four divisions, like he's from the West and there's men from each of the other three as well. Johnny and Enright and Paul Curran. Paul Curran's still hurling with uh, Mulnahone. With Mulnahone and Johnny Enright, former Thurla Sarsfields hurler. And I suppose the fact that, like, do you know, there's 32 senior teams in Woolly, in, in Tipperary, Woolly. So, like, it just goes to show, like, there could be... Um, a few players who might, you know, slip through the cracks. Maybe they didn't make it underage. They've um, done well for their club in the last few years. And like when you have a man from each division, like there's divisional championships in each of those divisions. So they, those lads will know who the hurlers are. And I suppose that will be a, a good thing for Tipperary hurling in, in general going forward. Like, yeah, no, it definitely will. It's all about the it's all about the backroom team. Um, yeah, so big big fan of Colin Bonner so far. There's no point. I, I don't want to be disrespectful of Colin Bonner. Almost underwhelming choice, but everything he's been saying since he got it and his Tommy Dunn back in, you know, like, mm. I mean, you'd start be looking at that, um, you know, a little bit more enthusiastically. Uh, last story of the day before we get into Porik Mahoney. Shane Curran, like, I mean, these lads are just addicted to it. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I was looking at Ricey McManaman. It looks like he's going to be in with Cavan. He finished playing. He, he, he managed a ladies football team. And then he went in under uh, Rory Gallagher. And then he managed Fermanagh. And now he's gone maybe in under yeah. Mickey Graham. And, and Shane Curran's been around the block. Just love coaching and managing. Um, he's after managing. Geez, I'll be killed in Westmead for pronouncing this wrong. C A U. L R R Y Cowlery. I never heard of that club before. They've they've made the knockout stages in the Westmead uh, Championship for the first time in their history. That's probably why I've never heard of them. Um, Shane Curran gets a red card to get a last minute goal. <laughs> Curran's already in the stand, Connor. Uh, they draw two two ten to one thirteen against neighbours Moat, and all this is kicking off in Westmead. Curran's in the stand, the last minute penalty, and nobody really, no one in the country knows of all these little subplots that are going on all over the place. Yeah, drama, drama and Shane Curran going hand in hand. Yeah, again, it's fair to see. Isn't it? I wanted did like I, I was just looking into it. And I couldn't. I didn't get any you know revelations on why he was exactly red carded. But I'm sure it was a a cool, calm, and collected argument he might have had with an official uh, on the <laughs> Yeah, they looked out. Another little, nice little story out of this. One of the goals, Cowlery. Do I, any better pronunciation of this, lads? Am I right, I'm Cowlery? Feeling, uh, <laughs> me, anyway. No, I'm going to leave you here. Let you suffer this. I'll, one. I'll have about four DMs yeah. by the end of tonight. <laughs> <I'll> on. <laughs> one of Cowlery's goals was scored by Ollie Baker's son, which is incredible. I'm pretty sure he's a um, 
he's an inspector, a guard or something, Ollie is in Westmead, somewhere like that. So his son is playing football. I would have thought this, that would have abandoned the Baker house. But, uh, he's seen the light. He's seen, <laughs> he's seen the light. Another, little, another nice little story. Anyways, I thought it would be a nice one to finish with there. Um, we'll, leave, we'll leave it there, lads, and we'll come back with Porik Mahoney. So Bally Gunner won eight in a row yesterday, as we know, and Porik Mahoney scored nine points and he joins us on the line now. How's it going, Porik? Good, Colin. Yourself? All good. All good. How's the head today? Uh, not too bad, no. Not too bad. Um, the early closing of the pubs is a good thing, I think. <laughs> uh, especially uh, <laughs> moving on in the years now, so um, the earlier you're home, the better. So, But look, no, we had, we had a, a good bit of crack last night and, um, you know, I think moments like that like this you really have to enjoy and celebrate and you know after a long year a lot of hard work going in so um, yeah it's great to get, get a reward at the end of it and, and what's the plan for today obviously you're, you're a little bit fresher than you would if there were later pub times like I presume you have it's eight in a row you have the day after kind of schedule down to a down to a tea at this stage yeah we do we do um, I suppose we're after getting familiar with the routine over the last number of years but um yeah, no, we will we'll, we'll meet up there later later today um, and just go down to one of the local pubs for a few more points, I suppose, and a little bit more celebration. But there's a few of us actually heading off to Port- Portugal there tomorrow morning, so we'll have to wrap it up pretty early there this evening. So um, so we're fresh for the flight in the morning. Jesus, this eight-week gap until the Munster Club, you're making sure you take advantage of that anyway? Yeah, there, yeah it's, it, it's strange, I suppose, because normally in previous years, you're kind of straight into the Munster Club where I suppose you're, you're, you know, you're obviously coming, you have to come quickly down off the, off the high, I suppose, of the, of the victory, and you're back training two or three days later, but I suppose in this situation now, we kind of have a little bit of break, and probably no harm, um, clear up a few little niggles and injuries that we have within the squad, so I suppose we'll just have to make the most of it, really, and, um, you know, get back training next week, and, and put the heads down, and, um, you know, I suppose it's going to be difficult to... to prepare compared to previous years but um, there's a good setup there and, and I'm sure the lads will, are already working on a plan to make sure that we're ready for a seven weeks time Yeah, it is a bit of a disadvantage for you guys though isn't it? Like eight weeks is an awful break it's almost like the break after winning a Munster to an All-Ireland semi-final which is a terrible weight as well like I mean you, you obviously in Waterford played a hurling off first, it's not much of an advantage to you to you guys in Ballygunner Not really, I suppose we do have a lot of the lads who are involved with golf here in the football as well so um, it's going to be difficult to manage that in terms of numbers and and you know getting lads get, you know getting the full group together. But as I said, the likes of Shavis Patrick and David Franks, these lads, you know, they're they're they're, they're well used to the big stage and getting getting teams to to, to their pitch when, when when it's needed. So I, I I'm happy to leave it in their hands now, and um, I'm sure they'll 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 have a plan. To, to make sure that we're, we're in peak peak condition, peak performance for, for eight weeks' time. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about today, mentioning the schedules, has the tradition of going to the schools with the Cup, is that is that not back up running again, with obviously with some restrictions still still in place? Yeah, no, unfortunately it's not. Um, uh, obviously going up to Ballygunner National School and, and down to the Gwales School has always been a ritual on the Monday after a county final, but um, unfortunately with the COVID restrictions it's not, but I'm sure... The couple will probably um, be in the school in, in in the school at some stage this week, all right. Yeah, yeah, no, it, pro- it probably will. You're winning the finals pretty easily uh, now, Porik. I know, like, I mean, y- you know, every county final is going to be difficult. Uh, I saw Stephen O'Keefe and your manager talking about focusing on a good start. Is that kind of the way you, you see it? Not give these underdogs any hope and just kind of you know blow it out of their out out of the water early. Yeah, look, I suppose every game you kind of have different strategies and different plans and different approaches to the games. And and yesterday, obviously, we you know, I suppose we said we need to we need to really you know lay down our marker from from the minute the ball is thrown in. And, and I suppose we did kind of we went pretty aggressively at the start. Um, obviously, you know, you see Ty Foley playing corner back, and next minute he's up in the full forward and giving a pass to Desi for the goal. And I suppose we kind of just you know it was kind of shackles off really in the first five or ten minutes and and there was a strong breeze there in much park yesterday so we knew that like if if, if we did if we did stand back and let more get on top of us that before we know it we could have been four five six points down and, and all of a sudden they're chasing the game so um yeah we we did put a, a lot of emphasis on on the start yesterday and it, it is nice when you when you 
you talk about something during the week and then it actually pays off on the day. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And like, I mean, you're wearing number 15, you're drifting around, you're almost like you have a little a free, whatever role you want. You like to, to get it across the Desi as soon as possible. I think you all like to get it across the Desi as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose when you have Desi in the form, like he's in there yesterday, why wouldn't you feed him the ball, you know? Yeah. And um, But like, it, it's, it's you know, you look back over the last couple of games, I suppose, and it hasn't just been Desi, you know, a lot of the younger lads really have stepped up to the plate this year and um, you know when leadership was needed it wasn't the kind of the I suppose the lads who were there the last you know six or seven eight years it was it was the lads that are there the last one or two years and that was really great to see and um, you know I suppose they're the lads that kind of keep the older lads motivated and, and keep pushing us and training and you know, ultimately they're getting the best out of us and, and we're hopefully getting the best out of them. So there's, there's a nice balance there at the moment. Yeah, there is a nice balance. And like, I mean, there's a lot of talk, obviously, with younger players coming through that this dominance doesn't look like it's it's going to stop. And, you know, it ha- had the same thing in Leash with Port Leash. They got nine in a row before they were beaten and then won another three. Like some people say the dominance isn't good for Waterford Hurling. Then I suppose you look at your county team and the county team's flying it. So I don't know how the two kind of marry together. Yeah, like, uh, I, I don't know, uh, people say it's not good for Waterford Hurling. Like, when you you look at the Waterford Championship this year, I think it's been a great championship. Um, you know, we, we were, we were, I suppose, backs to the wall in the last two games against Formal Water in the quarterfinal and Mount Sinai in the semi-final. And, you know, a puck of the ball, either way, Yeah. Uh, ultimately decided them games. So, there's certainly the gap that people may talk about. Uh, yes, looking in from the outside yesterday, you might, you might think there's a gap there, but there's certainly not, and there's... You know, there's five or six teams there that you know uh, on any given day can can beat anyone, and and to me, to me, the Warford Championship is is stronger than it's ever been at the moment. Yeah, you definitely you seem to have a right uh, set up in that even like, like Barry Coughlin retired, he probably would have had a couple more years. Your brother Philip retired, he would have had a couple more years. Stephen O'Keefe announced his retirement on TG Cahar after the game yesterday. I thought he'd be back uh, with Waterford. The great thing, I suppose, that Bally Gunner players have is that they know they're going to have, you know, a good season and be playing high-level hurling, you know, um, towards the latter end of the season. So it, maybe it makes the decision for those lads to finish up with the county that little bit easier. Yeah, maybe, and I, I suppose you know we we set high standards in Ballygunner as well, and it, it can be quite demanding and challenging to kind of stay up to the kind of level of inter county and then carry that right through to the club season. So, really, you're like you say there, it's it's you could be talking ten, eleven months of the year where you're with very little downtime, and I suppose ultimately the likes of Barry, Philip, and Stephen have have made that call, knowing that with with comfort that Ballygunner is going to be still at um, you know, a high intensity and a high level and, and trying to achieve something. So I suppose it does make it a little bit easier. But um, yeah, so I, I suppose in, in the overall p- bigger picture, like it's um, we're very, very fortunate that we can go up to the pitch in Ballygunner and, and that there's you know, such good club men there that are keep driving it on every year. Same same heads are there and, and ultimately we're, we're just really, really lucky that we're part of this setup at the moment. Barry Coughlin in his speech uh, yesterday thanked the management team, the backroom team and the performance team. What the hell is going on here? What kind of a, what kind of a backroom team do you guys have? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's anything outside of the, the norm anyways, but it's uh, as I said, we're, we're very, very fortunate that, you know, David Franks is obviously down with us for the last five years and he's he's like uh, one of our own club mates at this stage um you know he's just part of the furniture now here and, and we're very very lucky to have david and, and then you know there's a, as i said there's a lot of a lot of experience and and, and knowledge within the ballygunner um within the ballygunner club and, and thankfully we're able to pull on a lot of resources from that and you know the likes of Tygo sullivan for example from we're very very fortunate with the likes of Tyg and shanae fitzpatrick siobhan and shay fitzpatrick like you know what a family they are from a doctors, physios, trainers, they they have it all, and, and we're 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 just lucky at the moment that 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 they're all in the club at the one time. Yeah, you need the physios anyways after the year um, you're after having. So how do, how are you feeling now? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. The knee is very good, um, which is obviously the being the top priority is get, has been getting that right. Uh, but you know yourself when you come back from a, a long term injury, you start picking up little niggles here and there. So I suppose, like you say there. Uh, I think Siobhan is uh, sick of seeing me now every night for the last five or six weeks just to get me onto the field and I'm obviously very, very grateful of the work that they've done over the last number of weeks um, because we haven't got a huge volume of training done so hopefully now um, with a little bit of rest over the next week and then we will start getting some um, high high level of training in before Munster Club. 
you've had the weirdest kind of uh, year in that you missed no county, you missed no club uh, hurling whatsoever. You won the county final last year. Um, and now you're back to win it again this year, but you've missed two winter county seasons. Like I mean, with the the way the winter championship happened last year, this one bloody injury, which happened last October, just before the last year's uh, November December championship, and ran through to miss two seasons. Yeah, it was unfortunate, um, no doubt about it. And obviously, uh, especially last year, it was extremely tough because it was so close to the to the championship when it happened. I think it was it was I think it was two weeks out from the first round of the Munster Championship against Cork so it was extremely difficult I suppose you had more kind of time then to prepare yourself for you know the, the games this year and I suppose it's um, a little bit different too standing, sitting in the, in the stand as a spectator and I was I would have gone to a couple of games with tied to work and I suppose the two of us kind of looking at each other kind of saying Jesus we're after we're after getting a, 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 a tough deal of it here but that's just sport I suppose and as I said yeah, it made yesterday all the sweeter too. After you know watching a lot of hurling over the last say twelve months, and to get back out there yesterday is and just to be you know I suppose close to your full fitness, it, it, it's just great. They, like t- talk to me about how the injury happened because it was in a challenge game against Wexford, like you said just before the championship. And from reading stuff you said, like I mean, you felt a twinge when you reached in. Uh, I think to to t- to tackle. And played on, and then felt it again when you gave a hand pass. Like these cruciates are happening. I, I I can't get my head around them. They're happening so innocuously, and you're out a year, even though it doesn't feel like that bloody much on the field. Yeah, yeah, it's it's mad. I suppose it, like I I didn't. You know, normally you'd hear people twisting or they jump up for a ball and they land awkwardly on it. I was literally just running after someone and like literally put my hurley in to try and intercept the, the, the ball off off, off um, the opponent. And next minute, I just felt something in the back of my knee. I suppose you had um, an excruciating pain for maybe 20, 30 seconds and thought none of it then. I kind of was saying to myself, Jesus, I'm after, you know, make a show of myself here with a little bit of a roar. Like, and next one, all of a sudden, I'm back up playing. And then I just took it, went to turn again then. And uh, should they say you could you could run a marathon, like, with, with a cruciate, with your cruciate gone? It's just because it, it, it's, it's, you can run straight lines. It's just if you turn, you, 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 you'll know all about it fairly quickly. And, yeah, I, I don't know why I don't know why it's so prominent in, in sport. Now we obviously had um Tim O'Sullivan done his his ACL for Ballygunner this year and the same kind of thing just in a in a challenge match didn't look to be anything in it at all and next minute all of a sudden two days later he gets a scan and his ACL is torn. So I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 is it the training or or what? What, yeah. what it is but there's I'm sure there's plenty of different theories out there and do, and do the same they, way it's happened yeah. so much but do do the surgeons when you go in and talk to them do they have any explanation or do they understand how especially in your case where you just kind of you were just kind of running like do they have any understanding or uh, they, uh, theories on how, yeah. how it would happen they say like I don't I don't they, I didn't really ask too many questions on it now but I suppose maybe we were doing a heavy block of training at the time at Warford and so maybe because I suppose we were kind of after being, you know, I suppose away from each other for so long that we probably were trying to catch up on a couple of weeks training and, and squash it into kind of a, a short period of time. Maybe that I was a bit fatigued playing that match. I don't know. Um, but really, he's just unlucky. That's that the surgeon was saying, tell Ty was telling me that lucky, you're just very unlucky. There's there's not, you know, there's no real reason to say why it happened. Um, or there's no nothing to say that you had a weakness there, or or, or anything in particular. It's just an unfortunate kind of turn, and, and next one all of a sudden it's, it tears, and there's no real explanation for it. Yeah, and like I mean, just at last on this out of curiosity, say if you had when you felt that excruciating pain, if you had gone off at that stage, would you would you have been in a better situation than if when you know you felt the pain again, or like even for players listening to this, like I mean, the minute you feel that excruciating pain in your knee, just go off, you know, it it'll go away. Yeah. But that I don't maybe not enough players understand, you know, what that is. Maybe yeah, maybe yeah, yeah that's true. I, and I suppose. You know, they, they say, I suppose, when, when, whether you, you, you slightly do your ACL or whether you completely tear it, it's still, you still have to go under the same procedure, same operation. Oh, so right. I suppose that the timelines are, are the recovery time period, I don't think it's going to be any different. You know, it, they say now you nearly need to give it the nine months, like, um, before you can kind of go back into full contact play, like, so... Um, I, I don't think I'd done it any worse. I obviously tied the work when he done it in the All-Ireland Final. Um, against Limerick, he he obviously he 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 went, um, done it and went the same thing. Went try and play again and then felt it again. Like so, I don't think it was 
it, it wouldn't make any difference if he went off the first time, for example. Yeah, no, I get you. And Peter Casey obviously did his in the All Ireland final, and he was tipping away trying to stay, run it off. <laughs> I mean, is it mad you think in your head you can run off an injury that keeps you out for nearly a year? Yeah, I suppose it's just in in the heat of the moment, like All Ireland final, you'd literally do anything to to stay on the field, and I suppose that's why the two lads have probably tried to uh, go again, even though they deep down they probably knew that you know uh, they were in bother, but. You know, I suppose the last thing you want to turn around in, in, in a week in a week after an All-Ireland and all of a sudden you're fine again, you know, and you could have played on. So I suppose you're kind of, you're, will, you're willing to do whatever it takes to kind of stay on the field. Yeah. So, you like, I mean, it even added more heartbreak to you. You were supposed to be captain that year and you stayed involved with the team. You were in, with, you know, pretty much Liam asked you to stay involved. And then 2021 season, you watched it with Tyg in the stand. You didn't want, did you want that separation away from the panel or you just didn't want to be around a fo- two years in a row kind of injured? Yes, yeah, so but I suppose I probably just needed to, for myself, uh, more than anything really, I just had to be a little bit selfish about last year and just, you know, completely focus on my rehab. Um, and it is, you know, anyone that you talk to about the ACL, you kind of get one opportunity to get it right. Um and the rehab program is is pretty intense. Like you're 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 at it every day. Um, I I suppose for myself, I I was bit kept busy with work, and and I wanted to kind of just make sure that between mornings and evenings, I had it free for myself to to control my own rehab program. So I I suppose I I completely stepped away from Waterford and from Ballygunner um for the initial periods of of, of this year. Um, and I think you know it probably pay 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 it probably paid off in the end. Because you know I'm I'm, in, I'm happy with the position I'm in right now. Right. Okay. So you kind of do your recovery on your own time rather than having to go to training. You know to to meet up to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I and I suppose it's kind of fortunately enough. I we Philip and I we put a gym into the house there. But um, last March just before the lockdown came in, and so I suppose I was able to. I had everything kind of. Um, you know, I suppose to with ease to kind of do the rehab, so it kind of just made sense then to kind of to do it at home and um, you know, because I could juggle around with work and things like that. So it just suited it was what suited best. So come here, you kept Liam Cahill, which I'm sure you're all delighted about. What was the the players WhatsApp group like in around the time when he was uh, potentially talking to Tipperary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Like I, I suppose everyone was kind of in the middle of the kind of club championship, uh, preparing for the club championship at the time. So it was kind of, you know, yourself. Obviously, when you're when you're involved in the intercounty setup, it's kind of like for seven or eight months of the year, you're kind of like, you know, you're you're talking daily and and you're you're basically living with each other for 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 that period. And then all of a sudden, you go back to the clubs and it's, it's you kind of distance a, li- a little bit. Yeah. But I suppose during that kind of period, everyone was kind of onto each other. You know, hope and really stay and and. What are they hearing? Kind of nearly more than anything, you know. And I suppose um, just a kind of a bit of relief there as well when he did stay on because it's it's obviously does huge work on in the last two years. So um, and obviously the players are kind of eager to to drive on from that. So we're we're, we're delighted that that Liam is, is 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 staying on. Yeah, and I suppose his reasons for staying on, like I mean, he pointed out that his reasons for staying on is his loyalty to you players. Like I'm sure you'll run through a wall for him next year that he's turned down his own county because he's created this bond, you know, with, with you guys and speak so highly of you. Yeah, no, it definitely was a real statement from Liam and and um, I suppose a, a confidence booster for the players if they ever needed one. Really, that you know, that Liam has full faith in in the squad that's there and. I suppose um, it's really back back to the players now to kind of you know to 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 pay him back I suppose and and in terms of just the application when it comes to you know when when the when the panel does regroup um and and you know just making sure that you're giving all to to, to make sure that you know it, it, we can drive on from from 2021. Yeah, definitely. Because like I mean, most people would agree you're the second. Like you've gone from probably when you lost the All Ireland final to Galway, you went through a few poor years then, and uh, he came in. And like the, the the transformation, you know, has been incredible. Like most people would have his second to Limerick, you know, in the country on the form of, you know, since he's took since he's taken over. Yeah, look, every year is different, and and I suppose when when you are at the kind of um, the top table there, you know, competing with the likes of Limerick and Cork and Galway and Kenny to Prairie, I suppose every year then kind of you know now teams are going to be analysing Waterford in a lot more detail, um, like they would be with Limerick. So I suppose really. Watford are really back in the pack now at the moment, and and you know if we think that we're, we're we've a, a right to be up up there with Limerick every 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 year, well I think very quickly we'll be, we'll be brought back uh, down a peg or two. So 
it's, it's really just getting that foundations right now and and you know getting that pre-season work in and um you know just making sure that that the team is uh, equipped as best as possible for for the for the national league and then bringing in the championship yeah exactly finally before i let you go like i mean i think it was the it was Queely, the 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 manager the the rat motor the own more manager he was yeah. talking about you being All-Ireland, uh, you know, All-Ireland champions in the making. Now, I know you're not going to say something like that because, you know, that that would be a bit stupid on, on your point of view. But I presume at the start of the year for Ballygunner now, like, I mean, you won a Munster, you almost beat Ballyhill Shamrocks and then you lost the Munster final. It was in a, a terrible day and then COVID hit. Like, I presume at the start of the year, like, I mean, you want that All-Ireland title without getting, you know, I don't, I'm not looking for you to get ahead of yourself, but, like, I'm sure that, like, that's a burn, something burning at you guys now. Yeah, it is, I suppose. Look, every team that, you know, has has aspirations of, of going to the whole way and we're no different to that. But, I, I, look, I, I think the reason why, you know, we've been pretty much successful in, in Warford is that we, we, we really are, we do take every game as it comes and, and, I know it's easy to say that here now, and it's kind of, it's the, I suppose sitting on the fence a little bit with 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 that answer. But it is the reality of it with Bally Gunner. I think that's why we, we complacency is one thing that we kind of pride ourselves on in that we don't let it seep into the into the setup. And um, no matter who we're playing, what stage it is at, you know, we're we're we're, we're making sure that we're 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 at the pitch and and you know where we need to be in terms of our preparations and performances. So. Like obviously, um, we'll now if the next step for us is 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 to focus in on the next seven or eight weeks and and get ready for the Clare Champions and in the, in the quarter final the Muscle Championship and you know hopefully hopefully we can um, progress further further than that and and that's that's ultimately will be the goal. Yeah, well I'm sure I'm sure you will. You'll be right in the mix anyways. Come here, Porik. I won't keep you any longer. Thanks for it's uh, thanks very much for taking the call. Good to see you back on the field uh, winning again. Sure. Cheers, Gordon. Thank you. Great stuff from Porrick there. Right, we'll leave it there. That's all we've time for today. We'll be back on Thursday. Uh, Brian McAvoy um, is going to be on on Thursday um, to talk about championship, championship structures. So I'll be able to have a bit of an argument with him. So we'll talk to you all then. Good luck.